From Grief to Grace with Leah Morris, Luther DeConca Lippert, and Reverend Diane Rollard. I was listening this morning as I went for a walk to the video that you made, Leah, from Grief to Gratitude, which was kind of the inspiration for this service. It was so beautiful. You talked about your whole experience at the beginning of the pandemic. You had these moments of grace that just came to you and transformed you. First thing I asked you was your definition of grace, your understanding of grace. Because for me, despite growing up in a religious background and hearing that word pretty often and singing, you know, amazing grace, it was part of my vocabulary without having very deep roots in my psyche, right? Like it was just sort of this nebulous word that was being tossed around as something God might grant you, but what even is it? <laughs> and I would love to just briefly visit the definition of grace as it's going to be approached in this conversation. You remember last time we spoke, we were talking about whether we should call the service Grief to Gratitude and have it based in this video or call it Grief to Grace. And if moving from grief to gratitude, grace was this sort of flowing energy that supported us in that transformative movement. So it turns out, etymologically, grace and gratitude are like this. Yeah. Yes. Grace comes from the Latin, uh, gratus or gratia. And then it came into, into French as, as grâce and English as grace or, or gratitude. It's the same root. So I love that. And in, in Spanish, gracias, you know, it's like a word of thanks and it's, it's being full of grace, you know? And then in French, uh, l'action de grâce, thanksgiving, that the action of grace be a giving of thanks. Mm -hmm. For some reason, grace really makes me think of dancing. I, I think of, of fluid, fluid movement and thinking of how when one moves gracefully, one's body is moving full of thanks. I find that deeply inspiring. What I actually found when I started to dig deep was that it's vast. To be graced with something can mean to be blessed, to be adorned. It can mean so many different things. You know, in the religious tradition, particularly I think Christianity, though there are also concepts of grace within other traditions for sure, there is this idea that you didn't work for this thing. You didn't ask for this thing. It was just something that God gives you. In some traditions that can be very dividing, but there are beautiful moments in our lives. There is beauty in this world. There is beauty in nature. And we didn't work for it. We didn't ask for it, but we are blessed by it. And I just think of those moments that we have where we go into those very dark places in our lives. And then, then something brings us out of it and something transforms us. What is it? What is that amazing thing that pulls us out of there? Because it doesn't always happen, but when it does, it is such such an amazing moment. And so, you know, so think of those words, amazing grace. What was it that changes you in that second of going from that dark place to opening up to something completely different and maybe becoming someone completely different in the process? That's grace. That's grace to me. Thank you, because that actually <laughs> helps me you know, frame how I want to, you know, engage with that question. We can talk all night and day about what grace means to us. And it helps to have that common awareness of the roots and the language, but you know, we're all gonna come, regardless of how much we talk about it, the symbols that we hold in our mind are still gonna be what we see, what we hold, what we perceive. So the closer we can get, I think, to defining what our symbols mean for us, um, helps us to at least understand each other better. When you were talking about Amazing Grace, that song, most of you probably know that the song was written by a slave trader, a gentleman who was captain of a slave ship. The, the way I understand the story is they were caught in a storm and death was certain and yet he lived at least, I don't know how much of his crew did or his ship did <laughs> survive, but he lived to be converted from believing that it was appropriate and okay to, to trade in human lives. And one of the ways he marked that change was writing that song that, that has outlived him, that has touched so many souls and that's gonna continue to be part of our culture and our lives. What a, he's immortal, right? Like he was made immortal through that experience. There's definitely parallels for me in the last year. Like I look at the pandemic, like I was sailing along, I certainly wasn't doing anything as, as you know, questionable, weird as the person who wrote that song. But I was 
on autopilot to a large extent. I was living my life. I had my expectations. I had my schedule. I had my order. And then zoop, the rug was swept out. And I know everybody, I see you, Luther, I see you nodding. Yeah, we all know. It was just like from one day to the next, the who you are of who you are, of how you're living, the story completely stripped away. And for people like myself who are working in the arts industry, you know, it was especially challenging. There's no home office when what you do is go and perform in front of people and for all intents and purposes that's taken away. Or if you teach or if you're in a church environment, for the, the very first impression that I had was whoop, gone. Everything that you think of as not just your livelihood, not just your income, but the way that you contribute to your community. You know, I still had my family and thank everything for my kids. I look at them as the reminder that I was not gonna break down and completely lose my stuff, right? My kids are going to see me handle this with grace. <laughs> I don't know what that means or what that looks like, but I know I'm modeling. I'm not just in this for myself. I've gotta, gotta get this together. So that's why I went into my son's room while they were off scampering about and having fun. I went to, the, that was the darkest room in the house had all the lights out, got down on the floor and had my ugly cry and just mourned everything that I felt was no longer accessible. So for me, that sort of parallels with that ship adrift in the storm, all is lost. Oh my gosh, what even is this? Am I, am I gonna die? It felt like a death and it was a death. It was a death of the trajectory of my life up to that point. And it was this total uncertainty of what was coming next, no clue. I can remember maybe one or two other times in my entire life that I've let myself feel that kind of grief. And, and that's been sort of a superpower for me to a large extent, being the be positive person that I am, being able to, to bounce back from things and, and you know, every look on, always look on the bright side of life. And, but in that moment, I stopped fighting the grief. I just let myself feel the entire morning experience that was appropriate, maybe that's the moment when the grace kicked in. Because maybe, maybe if I con considered resisting it and, and just trying to be the, you know, oh, I'm just gonna be, everything's gonna be great and I'm gonna be fine. What I did instead was surrender. <laughs> I surrendered to the grief. I said, you know what? I don't know what this is gonna be. And that hurts and it's scary and as human beings, modern people especially, it's really hard to admit that we don't have complete control of the situation. But I think that's when the grace kicked in and when I was able to say, I don't know what it's gonna be, but I know I'm gonna be all right. It's not under my control, which actually might be a really good thing because <laughs> what would I do, I, right? I'm, I'm gonna turn this over to a power, a wisdom much greater than mine. <sighs> And I'm gonna trust that we're gonna survive this. And I'm gonna trust that my way will be shown. I, I have no idea what that looks like. Okay, let it go, let it go and trust. I can say that the last year, although it has been challenging repeatedly for me, for my family, and of course, for our global family, um, there's been so much blessing having to let go, really having no choice, but to say this tech is being weird today, bless it. <laughs> you know, this, we don't know when we're gonna be able to get back together in our, in our sanctuaries, but we're gonna make the best of what we have available. You know, just bless it, bless it, bless it. And I'm so grateful for what is there. That's the long answer. <laughs> it was a beautiful answer. No, 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 no. That's not too long at all. We love this. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I think definitely we we've had we've had the same experience in that sense of just finding so much blessing and so much grace in this time. But you also make me think of times in my own life when I have just really thought this is it i'm i you know just such a place of sadness and and despair and just thinking i'm not going to get out of this and then something and sometimes it's you know reaching out to someone help, who helps pull you up and and there's grace in that and for me i think one of those hardest times was a moment when the resolution was setting out on this path towards ministry 
it came out of a really, really hard time. I think of what you had said when we talked last about the 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. And the the preacher that you, you named saying, you can be in the valley of the shadow of death and you don't have to pitch a tent there. And I think there's, there's grace in that moment when you say, oh, actually, even if I did pitch a tent here, maybe I can, I can lift it up now. Yeah, I love that imagery so much. To have grown up with the valley of the shadow of death as being a place that you're passing through and so that awareness is there. And I think sometimes, uh, sometimes we get cozy <laughs> in that and, and almost get this feeling that, and, and you know, I don't wanna speak for anyone else, but that it can be tempting as we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death to think that there's nothing beyond it. But if we do remember that, yea, though I walk through, you know, that, that this too shall pass, that there's, there is a promised land and a new ourselves on the other side of this valley. I love that so much that you pointed that out, that on the other side of these experiences is a, is a not just a potential for, but is absolutely guaranteed the butterfly version that has come out of the cocoon of ourselves, you through the ministry, that's massive. That's an entire reworking of yourself in the world, right? That's what an upgrade. <laughs> it's like the wings, you know, total upgrade. And I feel like this last year for me has been a massive upgrade. It's making me think about a, a few different experiences in my life, but the one that comes to mind right now that happened in the last year is the loss of my last home that in a huge way was a cocoon. It was a, a very safe, space, a creative space that I shared with, with loved ones. When new landlords took over the lease and they let us know that they were going to massively renovate and that everybody would have to leave and that we were face to face with this, this thing that's become a term, renoviction, right? Eviction through renovation. And this is happening around the world. Um, I've seen it very strong in, in Montreal and in NDG, my, my lifelong you know, community. And when I thought about losing that place, I, I couldn't see anything outside of that. It was just my everything. It was only when I started to kind of scratch at the surface of that narrative and just ask, what if? What if there is something beyond this? That things started to open up. And it's, it's been a massive upgrade. Like I, I can't even believe how much my life has changed in the last year. And I'm so grateful for it. It's not easy. There are so many deaths in a, in a single lifetime. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think about those butterflies, about how, you know, when they're the caterpillars in the cocoon, like their, their sense, their molecular structure, like everything just dissolves, right? Like they just, they have to become goop. <laughs> like they have to completely surrender their identity, physically, tangibly become goop before they can like reemerge in a new form. And, and no one can, can open that chrysalis for them. They have to burst forth from their own sense of strength in order to, to be born anew into the world. And I think about seeds, you know, when seeds are, are planted in the earth and they're, they're, all, they're all tight and, and doing their thing, dreaming in the deep, dark earth. And then when they sprout, it's like this like bursting, right? And anyone who were to look at that from the outside, it would be easy to think that, it was an act of destruction that all had come undone, but it's what's necessary for the next phase of its being. I love the, from, from the outside, nobody can dive in, nobody can help, nobody can speed it up. But then from within, in that experience, the only thing, the best thing that, you know, as a seed, as a, a butterfly, as a becoming, the best thing I can do is just not resist. Just let the natural process be what it is. What I'm hearing and feeling too in this grace concept is that it's always there, <laughs> that it's always flowing. It's always part of our experience, but we get to dance with it, to be really in it when we become aware, when we recognize the grace. So it's like, it's it's just, and, and maybe that's part of the gift of these challenging times because they help us, you know, that, that whole, um, what is it, footsteps on the sand thing. It's like you were going along, not even recognizing that breath is a grace, that sunshine is a grace, that nighttime is a grace. And now you're taking a moment to stop and, and just feel how much grace has gotten you to this moment. And guess what? It's 
going to keep you rolling. <laughs> it's going to keep you rolling. That you've been given a gift that you didn't realize was even there in these times. The way that you described it, Leah, was that you, you realized you were born in the image of the divine. You know, as a minister, I love that. To recognize that <laughs> Luther is laughing at me. But to recognize we have this capacity, this, this, these beautiful gifts that we've been given. Here we are in the image of the divine. We can live with this grace and this gratitude in our lives. Yeah. In any future moments of doubt or despair, I'm just going to say to myself, you're goop. <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> this is just goop. <laughs> I am goop, yes. <laughs> and that might be the image of the divine for all we know. The divine is just goop. It's just a, it's just it's just all that star stuff goop out there that we are made of. I don't wanna prolong <laughs> go on this whole But it was just reminding me of uh, you know, in Genesis, like the the breath hovering over dark waters and thinking of like the chaos, the primordial chaos, that goop. <laughs> And then it's like, what is above it? That that um, that breath is that inspiration, right? Mm -hmm. That that yeah, that divine breath, that inspiration.